Well, my name is Stephen Hinton, and uh, Rod uh, got us to uh, rebuild the Con Lucky Constellation. So I was kind of uh, one of the members of the project and uh, kind of kept it on track. Um, and we just did a successful flight, so we're really excited about it. It was it's been a seven-year project, um, so we're really, really proud of it. Awesome. Tell me about those seven years. What was it like going through that process and, and just kind of getting it to here? Well, yeah, you know, we had a, a really good crew here at the Fighter Rebuilders, and uh, we all teamed together, and, uh, you know, it's an exciting project. And, and, you know, Rod Lewis has such a great collection of planes, and we know he'll use this airplane correctly. And, yeah. Um, but, but the project's all about, you know, there's so many people involved with it. I mean, everything from engines getting overhauled by, you know, Mike Nixon and, uh, you know, propellers coming from somewhere else and, and all the work it takes to clean it up. And parts aren't even hardly available for the Constellation. And right. It, uh, that's why it takes so long to do this stuff. So tell me a little bit about going through the flight today. What was it What was it like taking off? How did she settle in? Tell me. Talk me through the second y'all fired up those engines and got up in the air. Well, um... You know, we've run it, taxied it, and all that's kind of normal procedures. We have checklists, and uh, uh, Jeff uh, is our new uh, flight engineer, and we haven't flown with Jeff very much, so we're uh, feeling each other out and how we do things. But Jeff's got a lot more experience in these kind of planes than Stuart and I do. Um, but, uh, you know, the excitement, you know, rolling down the runway on takeoff, uh, that's pretty exciting. You know, after, you know, we had this thing all apart. We've had the landing gear out of it, we've had the outer wings off, had the tail off. You know, all the engines have been off. You know, we've rewired it, changed all the hydraulic lines, you know, so, you know, to get it all come together and, uh, you know, finally airborne, gear up, put the handle up and the gear goes up and you're looking at the, all the engine instruments, everything's just purring away nicely. That's really exciting, you know, and, well, I'm, I'm, I'm riding co-pilot on this flight and uh, so my job is, uh, you know, crew coordination, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm holding the yoke while he's running the steering and the throttles and then we transition, he grabs the yoke and then I'm following with the throttles in a sense, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on um, and calling out speeds. Yeah. And uh, Stuart's flown a lot of big four engine airplanes before. I don't have a lot of four engine experience and he's, yeah. he's the man for the job. Um, we're pretty light anyway. You know, we're like, we're almost 50,000 pounds lighter than gross weight. You know? And you could see how it landed short and how it took off real short. But, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, Beautiful plane, and uh, here again we want to thank uh, the foundation, uh, Rod's foundation, for uh, giving us the opportunity to put it together. My name is Jeff Weitzel. I'm officially the luckiest guy on earth because I just got to fly flight engineer again on the Lucky Constellation which was the first job I had when I was about 17 years old, which was about 150 years ago or so. And uh, to be back in the Connie again is a real treat, and especially this example of the airplane is stunning. Uh, honored, privilege, uh, pinching myself, can't believe it. And uh, what an effort on the part of our crew, all the folks who worked on this airplane, my hat's off. They did a wonderful job. And, uh, I'm a Johnny come lately, and you know I got I got to taste the icing, and I'm I'm forever in their debt. What does it feel like being here today and getting to watch your baby take off? It was amazing just seeing it eight and a half years ago take off from Arizona, yeah. and it was a hell of an event. Eight months to get it prepped so we could even take off, mm -hmm. and then uh, all this time outside, and then it, then it got in the hangar a couple of years ago, and to see it fly today, it's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have any words to describe it. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, the guys put their hearts in this. Mm -hmm. you know, they, especially Steve and his crew, Pete, all the guys that were here working on this thing all these years, they, they put their hearts in it. So you know, I'm just so happy that this, this, is, this day has come, actually. So yeah, absolutely. I didn't know whether it would. It really felt right when we got in the, uh, and started all four engines and did the run up and everything checked out perfect. First time we were able to check the controls, mm -hmm. it all worked perfectly. The servos were replaced, so mm -hmm. everything seemed to fall into place, and then we all decided Audio. it's time.
Uh, well, first, General MacArthur, right there, U.S. Right Air Force. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. that's where it started, and then, of course, Lockheed, before yeah. that even. Yeah. And I think I, I was I was really enamored with this airplane because of the history and then the, the condition it was in and, and where we started with it. So talk, to, talk me through that. What, what was the reason? Why, why this? Why, why Connie? You know, I think we'd, we've done so many other aircraft. I've done one Mosquito, working on another Mosquito now with a partner. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've done the B-25, the A-20. The A-20 was actually done here in Chino. And um, just wanted something unique, and I and I like one of a kind stuff, or one or two of a kind, you know. So this was rare. So we felt like, you know, let's just do something cool where we can all fly it, and we can all get in with our families and, and enjoy a warbird. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the thing. And I, I just wanted to do something different, and I wanted to have an aircraft that that really showed the big stuff. Mm -hmm. during World War II and the Korean War, especially, and all the way to the 60s. So mm. this one does it. What to say, so. now that it's all said and done, did it, what, did, it, did it come to fruition the way that you anticipated it? Is it grander? Is it, is it still it, coming it, together? It actually you... looks better than I thought it would. Yeah, it actually looks better, yeah. And we spent a lot of time with the paint job, the polish. Uh, they came to me with a budget for polishing, and I said, you know what, it's high as hell, but man, I want it polished. So I'm the one that they wanted to paint it. All the guys wanted to paint it, and I said, no. You know, I wanted an airplane like that one over there, but I yeah. <laughs> couldn't polish the whole damn thing. Yeah. But um, and, and you know, there's a lot of lot to this about honoring those who flew these airplanes mm -hmm. and honoring the guys who actually used them during the war uh, as transports. Mm -hmm. And then this aircraft has special history with NASA. Not only General MacArthur history. This was this was one of the uh, aircraft that was up in the air when Apollo's Apollo spacecraft were flying, and this provided the communications as they went around the the orbits. So this has a, a second life to it. It's very cool. Push the top. Airbus Constellation is holding at 3.5 to the uh, northeast. How far are you northeast, Constellation? <laughs> We're out here eight at the 8 miles. Here we come. Here we come. Uh, you want us to make a flyby? Yeah, we're going to do one flyby and go land, and uh, what, you, wind's 190 at uh, Niner. Can you land on 36? Yeah. That will take 36. We're heading in down. Nothing like a 10-knot tailwind. It's a long runway. Yeah, don't go over 250, though, okay? But if y'all want to land the other way, I will. Yeah, you're flying this thing. Well, you can request it if you want in the wind. Digital, watch your mic, folks. Watch your mic. There you go. Super Connie, how do you hear me now? Uh, Connie's on a long right base for a uh, few seconds. Head direct to the runway, sir. Direct to the runway. We are. Heading that way. Well, we got it. We got something up. You want to pull some power up? Yep, here? I'm gonna pull some power back. Let's pull back to 25 inches for now. So what are you gonna do after this? Just turn to the down? I'm gonna turn uh, to the right and stay away up, up from the. Uh, and uh, Connie, after this flyby, it'll be a right turn to the downwind for full stop. Right turn to the downwind, full stop. Runway 36. Really, really on base right now. Please. Okay, all the Corsairs hold short of runway 36. We got the Super Connie inbound. Well, it ain't a super, know, but it's but pretty super to us. Super like, duper. Attention, all Corsairs hold short of the runway. I tell you what, why don't we just make this pass, turn out to the right, come back around, and land south, let the Corsairs go? Yeah. And uh, Constellation, you would you like us to make a pass, go to the right, and let the Corsairs take off, and then we'll land uh, to the south? Sir, we have a program with them. I need you to make a right downwind and land as soon as you can on 36. Okay. All right, you see, we'll comply. You're going to have to make a 180, a 180 on uh, runway 36 to come back down to Papa 2. Okay. Right, okay. okay. Lining up good, looking good. Yeehaw. 
Corsair's taxi runway 18 hold short. Taxi 18 hold short, boss. Watch your speed. Watch your speed. I got it. I got it. Don't go to 270. I'm 250 right now. <laughs> Johnny's clear to land 36. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen, if you can tell me your emergency brake pressure, I'll do the rest. That's you, Steve. 18. Yes, sir. 1800. Okay. Parking brakes are off. Parking okay. brakes are off. Let's back her down there to about uh, 25 inches. 25, I. Less than that. Slow down. JT, I'm going to land a Super Connie on runway 36. 180 on uh, runway 18. Back that to Papa 2. I'm not going to slow down, let's pull five back. Okay, let's go all back to 22. Coming. It is, because I'm going to throw the fucking one gear out here. Super Connie's going to land on runway 36, do a 180 on the runway, back down to Papa 2. Okay. Then 170 for flaps. Okay, sounds great. 145 for gear. Give me flaps. Did you want to do one? No, Steve's good at that. Okay. My fellow legacy guy. Sam Bulper. Landing gear down. Your handle is down. And go to approach flap, please. Approach flap selected. Nose gear. Bang, bang. Main gear down lock. Pressure's up. Yeehaw. Looking good, you guys. Right base is a good turn. Just point, keep the high, the speed, the flap speed there. Landing gear. Gears down, locked. Check to your three greens. Okay. Hydraulic pressure quantities check. Make sure they're rich. All right, I got the throttles. Your throttles. And one more time, an emergency brake hydraulic pressure. Flaps please. to go. Yeah, pressure's go. full flap. Oh, that handle is full, and flaps are going down. We got plenty of drag. Base leg, you got it. Now, no pressure here, boss. You know, I mean, nobody's right watching. You just sneak right in. I know. Right on the number. 500. Bark the dog. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, I, I think I'll arm the reverse just in case something's weird. Okay, is that what you guys? Yep. Reverse is armed. 105 knots. 110 knots up here. You're looking good. Give me a little horsepower. What would you like? Oh, Give good. me about 25. Yeah, you're, you're, you're 30 you're now. Good. Okay, that's enough. Yeah, you're right there. Perfect. Flare, flare. Got it. All right. Beautiful. Hold the nose, hold the nose. Uh, I got it, I got it. Power off, I got the steering. Woohoo! I think you can make Papa 2 midfield here. Not this one. I ain't going to make this one. Uh, I may make the next one. On Papa 2 midfield. Where's Papa 2? Right up here. Right. You want us to do 180 and come back? Nope. You're going to make a left turn the next taxiway up here to your left. It'd be perfect. Oh, uh, straight in. Earlier. Yeah. Okay. Nice job. What wide turn here, Stuart. I know, but I'm I'm I don't like hitting these brakes like this, guys. JT, you can line up and wait when you're ready. He's left turning left to Papa Two. Okay, line up uh, Legacy. Look at that, awesome. Anytime on the door. Laps up, clean up. Uh, let's make the turn here. I watch the pressure while I'm doing this. I'm watching it. Pressure's good. Looking for ground support here. I'm looking for air. Yeah. Any time on the door, JD. Corsairs, JT, you have the airspace, you have the runway, you call it. I'm looking at he's, he's got it right here. Sir. Right here.
That's my girl. Wow, fantastic. Man, you did a great job. We're all at yeah. it. Are we putting the collared shirts on? Yeah, <laughs> we can. <laughs> Watch the props unwind, too. Okay, we're stopped. I'm going to hold the brakes till I get a chalk sign. Guys, Cutting down on your command. congratulations. Y'all did it. And shut them down. One and four. Congratulations, four. man. Thank you. everybody, we're here at Oshkosh 2023 and I'm standing in front of the Lockheed Constellation known as Bataan. It was a C-121A that had been uh, used as a uh, cargo plane for the Air Force originally and then it was one of six that they modified as a VC-121. And this particular one, a very historic airplane, was General Douglas MacArthur's airplane. It became part of a pool of uh, VC-121s used with uh, generals and dignitaries and, you know, if, you look at it now and it's a gorgeous airplane, but it was like from outer space back in those days, if you can imagine, you know, it's, it was as fast as any airplane flying in the 40s and long range, you know, it's got a 16, 17 hour range, uh, 250 miles an hour, it's, it's quite an airplane. What does it take to get to Oshkosh? Well, I tell you, this whole project started with the Legends Foundation uh, eight years ago. And uh, the airplane hadn't flown in uh, 20 years and uh, we did a complete restoration on the airframe. Uh, Completely new engines, rewired, we went through the whole thing and uh, we've just been flying it now maybe six weeks. Um, our trip to Oshkosh started out of uh, Chino, California. Yeah, we took off out of there, went six hours, 13 minutes nonstop to Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, we stopped there so we could stage ourselves for a Monday arrival. But we had a, uh, an oil leak on number three that uh, ended up costing us two cylinders to repair. Um, but here we are. Uh, uh, Stu Dawson was left seat on this trip. We trade trip uh, seats every time, but uh, Stu, uh, Captain Stu was, uh, we came in, did our low approach, 249 knots, and uh, pulled up to the downwind, uh, throttled back to about 25 inches on the downwind. Uh, first notch of flaps, 170 knots. Gear at 145, turn base. You know, go through the checklist, 120 on, on short final full flaps, and then uh, over the fence about 100 knots, and uh, Stu just made a perfect little uh, chirp chirp little landing, and uh, we didn't reverse, didn't need it. Uh, we did a little downwind, but still, the airplane's pretty light. It's it's at least 40,000 pounds under gross weight, and it, uh, it's got a big wing and uh, very controllable, real easy to fly. Uh, beautiful machine, uh, very, very, very complex for its era, but uh, that was the state of the art. Frequent 3713, contact round. Sorry. Okay, okay. And November Alpha is on the roll. Four highlights, here we go. Let's go. Five throttles. You got them. Power's Final. coming up. And don't, just don't worry about that one at all. Badger one track. All set. One all set. Departure roll, wind 170 at 11, runway 18, clear land, all advised on the cable. Badger one, we're traffic in track, copy up. Clear land, runway 18. Roger, right, landing gear up. A little funny story, we were uh, at the end of runway, cleared for takeoff, we shoved the throttles up to take off power and uh, kind of looked at each other, this thing really accelerated. We were airborne in 1,500 feet practically. Um, surprising but uh, we were more <laughs> I think we were like 52,000 pounds lighter than gross weight so it's actually uh, it climbs out very well and uh, 
It climbs out of 1,500 foot a minute at that weight. It just had a reduced climb power. So we were very surprised. You know, we're used to flying, you know, the big four engine airplanes are usually big, heavy, lumbering, slow climbing things. Well, this thing at the weights we're flying is, is pretty sporty. It's, it's fun to fly. Okay, you can see we just entered the big cargo door. This is airplane came, it was built like this. And uh, the interior right now is just something that was put together to accommodate the trip to Oshkosh. But uh, the plan is that uh, the foundation is designed a, an executive interior and it'll be, uh, uh, they have most of the parts, excuse me, made already <clears throat> uh, up in uh, Aero Metals, up in uh, Portland area. And uh, it'll be a, a very plush environment here, you know, it'll be leather and conference room up ahead. Yeah, this, what you see here, like I say, was just just done by the foundation just so it, uh, you know, could get us to Oshkosh. But uh, you can see the quality of uh, what's been built. Yeah, these are the dark seats that are going back in. There have been 24 total seats, 24 total places. There'll be a bar somewhere here, a conference room. I think the conference room is right here. I think it is partially into that, oh, yeah. That's galley. Yeah. The galley, that's going to be a restaurant. There's a conference table here, a bar back here, and then the rest is here. Oh, that's all of it right there. This is where it all happens up here. Up here, and then we got we got a lot of automation here for just safety issues. This this will. This is a camera system that will show gear, engines, everything we need to be looking at. Steve, you probably know more about it. Yeah, we have cameras around the outside of the plane and we can select it here. And we also have the ability in the cockpit to select. Go ahead and jump. Well, now this is where it all happens. So you've got a, you got a captain, you've got a pilot, you've got a co-pilot, you've got an engineer. And you can see the airplane's built for the engineer. He has most of the responsibility. Well, we work, we work as a crew, and like I say, we trade legs. You know, Stu and I both fly. But as a, as a co-pilot, you know, we're watching what's going on and try to make sure we're crew coordinated. But the function I have, for instance, is I could pump the landing gear down if it needs to go down in an emergency, or if we lose hydraulics, I could pump the brakes up and just follow uh, in conversation of, you know, you know, sometimes it takes two to do things. Uh, we had uh, early on, we, we were working on some landing gear issues, and uh, you know, it takes three guys, Jeff, and all of us are talking about what you know what what we think might might be the issue. And uh, you know, it's a big airplane. Just take your time and talk about it. You know, or you ask what it's going to take. Uh, we did a budget, and it was forty-six thousand dollars in fuel and oil to get here to here and back to Oshkosh. So it's a pretty big commitment, and. Uh, you know, people should, uh, you know, maybe don't know that, but uh, a lot of respect to Rod and the foundation for uh, pulling through on this. And and uh, to me, it's been one of the, like say, we've done a lot of projects through the years. This one's been the most challenging by by a lot and uh, and equally as rewarding. And we've got a lot of people involved. We had some structural engineers involved to figure out how to do things correctly. And, you know, we hired a lot of outside help. You know, they're just, it's the it's massive, you know, a massive project, and uh, it was really fun when we started turning the switches on and running the hydraulics and running the engines and, like I say, you know, quite a thrill running down the runway the first time too. But we're, you know, just being here, we had many people come up to us and said, "Hey, I'm a type rated in and, and tell us stories about this particular airplane we've never heard. Of. So I, it, that's another reason to come to us because. It, if we hadn't brought it here, we wouldn't hear all the, the yeah. history that we don't know. Yeah. I have to tell you, though, Rod, a lot of times I'll ask a specific question, like that I may, might need some help with, and they go, hmm, I don't know. <laughs>
uh, I'm not here or don't want to fly them anymore. So um, I think it was just to keep keep this going. You know, to keep keep uh, the, there's some very unique airplanes. I have a lot of one of a kind airplanes, and I just don't want to want that to disappear. And I'm sure someday uh, it's going to be hard to get these airplanes in there. It's going to be hard to find people, uh, the young pilots that want to fly these things. You know, they're getting they're getting up to her age. So I think mostly just to try to keep this going as long as we can to educate those who don't know about this history. We've been involved in some very unique um, flying activities, and it's, it's a great, great thing to keep preserved. We're frustrated fighter pilots is probably what we are. Those of us who weren't in the military like I wasn't, but I grew up as an Air Force brat, and I watched my dad do all these cool things and be in all these cool places and fly these incredible airplanes. And he, he went into the F-100 uh, series program and flew 100 series airplanes. So, and he was a demo pilot. So I got to see some really, really cool stuff growing up. So that's probably my motivation is, is my dad, you know. Well, you ask why do they always call on me? They don't always call on me. We've got uh, experience, you know, we've been doing this for a living. You know, I've been flying Warbirds since the 70s. This is my 50th year at Oshkosh. And uh, we've got an experienced crew and uh, a good relationship. We've done, this is our 43rd airplane that Fighter Rebuilders has done since 1980. And uh, we're really proud of it. And uh, it's a challenge. Everything's a challenge. We have a great relationship with our customers and uh, our friends and get a lot of help from the Warbird industry. And, you know, just being here in Oshkosh, you know, people can show off their wares here. It's a great place to connect with people. You know, Fighter Rebuilders has been uh, my line of income for 50, 40, 45 years anyway. So, you know, the Plains of Fame is where my heart is, but I mean, we have to uh, earn a living and uh, we also need to keep uh, support of the museum. So we keep a full-time crew working on other projects and available for the museum when they need it. But. Uh, you know, my son Steven has grown up and he's the 2.0 version. He's, uh, he's doing a great job. He's got a lot of projects in line and he, he's a perfectionist and he'll uh, up the standard and he'll up the quality of what's going on. I have to admit back in the 80s, this was a lot easier than it was in the 90s and you know, which is a lot easier than it was in the 21s. But now we're, you know, it, parts are running out. The airplanes are getting older and uh, we have a new generation of uh, people and we've also lost a huge number of uh, people that we had access to that uh, had this experience. Well this year uh, coming to Oshkosh we were invited to uh, partake in the Warbirds in review and we, unfortunately the airplane was still in Madison we missed that but uh, it means an awful lot when people have interest in, in airplanes like this and uh, Connie and the group did such a great job as far as we're concerned. We had a lot of interest in the crowd and uh, it was fun to tell our part of the story. You know, it's a very historic airplane. Uh, imagine what kind of deals maybe got do done in the back of this airplane. You know, it spent a lot of time in the, out in the eastern part of the world there and a lot of those people had never seen anything like this before. You know, something from the United States this big and shiny, it uh, made a big impression. Just kind of interesting. There's probably a lot of stories we don't know about that happen in this thing. The Lockheed Constellation was one of the most important aircraft in rebuilding of the airline industry after the war. Often described as the Queen of the Skies, it was the most powerful and advanced airliner of its time. A combination of many technical innovations came together in a true success story. In addition, 
the distinctive curves of the fuselage, and the perfect balance of the design, made the plane a thing of beauty and grace. Large four-engine transports are not always aesthetic, but the Connie's lines demand admiration. The Constellation was the pinnacle of piston engine transport design and broke new ground in both civil and military variants. However, its career overlapped into the jet age, and the appearance of new technology brought down a premature curtain on its lifespan. The Lockheed Company, with a heritage stretching back to 1913, had painstakingly built up a reputation for constructing excellent and trustworthy passenger aircraft. Commencing with the Vega and following up with the Orion, Lockheed's reputation blossomed. They became associates with the famous names of aviation between the World Wars. Wiley Post and Amelia Earhart both flew Lockheed aircraft. The second list of records said in Lockheed's planes grew rapidly. The company products were not simply a successful reworking of the day's technology, they were innovative and influential. Lockheed had a succession of talented designers. Jack Northrop was followed by Gerald Volte. When both of these men had gone off to found their own companies, Lockheed retained the services of a team led by the greatest engineering double act in aircraft history, Paul Hibbard and Kelly Johnson. Lockheed developed an excellent family of fast twin-engine transports in the Electras and the Lodestar, carrying between 10 to 14 passengers and what was comparatively only moderate discomfort. In 1938, Howard Hughes piloted a Super Electra around the Northern Hemisphere in just over three days and 19 hours. Hughes' respect for Lockheed was cemented, and later he turned to the company into trying to fulfill his aviation ambitions. The flight, of over 14,700 miles, confirmed a view held by many, including Hughes, that civilian airliners would be the mass transit method for the future. And to do this, the individual plane would need to carry many more people over much longer range. Lockheed had already been working towards this with their Model 44 Excalibur. Designed to carry 36 passengers, they were more than receptive when Hughes approached them on behalf of his airline, TWA. His basic specification was an aircraft that would fly a payload of 6,000 pounds from New York to Los Angeles, non-stop, in 8 to 9 hours. He would be a four-engined, pressurized, luxury airliner cruising at around 300 miles an hour. TWA had set the parameters for capacity and performance, but it was the Lockheed team which designed and built the plane. It drew on many successful elements of their earlier studies. The wing was expanded from that of the P-38 Lightning Fighter. The triple tail, originally designed by the Douglas Company, had been tested in the Model 44 project. Kelly Johnson was intimately concerned with the new project. Here in the wind tunnel, cameras catch him changing the shockboard in one of the long series of model developments. Because the plane drew so much on the work done for the Model 44, it was initially referred to as the Excalibur. However, it acquired a new number, the Model 49, and soon was given a new name as well, the Constellation. Lockheed's main rivals had been leapfrogging each other in airline development with Douglas reaping the majority of the rewards in America along the way. However, they did not have a client with the determination and checkbook of Howard Hughes to support them, and their designs were transitional rather than attempting one giant step. Lockheed had conducted a lot of relevant research and development during the 30s, and, 
they said it could fit well to approach the new design. The company had been involved in pressurization experiments with the Army, and Electra had been modified for the tests and given the Army designation of XC-35. The plane first flew on the 7th of May, 1937. With the information derived from these tests, Lockheed were able to devise the Constellation system. This maintained cabin pressure at ground level up to 9,000 feet and restricted pressure to that of 8,000 feet when the plane was at 20. The XC-35 was, in effect, a practical advantage that Lockheed held over their rivals. In a similar way, a lot of expensive development of the wing shape had already been born in the design of the Lightning. Even with these advantages, the cost per constellation quoted to Howard Hughes was, for the day, astronomical. Hughes' determination funded the development from its first meetings with the company in June 1939. However, its progress was slow. Many design problems needed to be overcome in reaching the stage where production would commence. Perhaps because the company had not built such a big aircraft before. Lockheed's team were very flexible about their approach. The series of decisions that set the Connie shape serves as an example. Large engines working at low revs were less likely to feel stressed and break down. So, a combination of such engines with large propellers were suggested. The large propellers demanded absurd ground clearance and very long forward undercarriage. To shorten that wheel strut, the nose is bent down. The large area of disturbance from the propellers suggests the triple tail will not work in flight. However, a more efficient single tail will not fit into a hangar. The solution? Curve the fuselage upwards and take the triple tail out of the propeller turbulence. The plane that results has a straightened S for a center line in the side view of the fuselage and it works. As a bonus, it's also beautiful. The first constellation went not to our Hughes airline, but to the United States Army Air Force. War had slept up the US, and civil aircraft production had become another arm of the war effort. Wartime pressures delayed the constellation further, but eventually, on January the 9th, 1943, Project 49 took to the air for the first time. The first plane was the production prototype. There was no transitional model. Existing commercial orders had been drafted even before the U.S. entry into the war, and by 1942, the Army added orders for 300 of the type, most with a more powerful engine. Now being military aircraft, the first constellations were given a military number. They became C-69s. The test series was delayed due to the trouble with the engines, and the first plane was not handed over to the U.S. Army Air Force until July the 29th, 1943. In the time the plane was grounded, Lockheed and TWA took the opportunity to repaint it and do some publicity shots. Some of the testing was also conducted in TWA livery and was used for publicity. This was nothing compared to the publicity coup pulled off by Howard Hughes with the second machine. The plane had been delayed in production 
and made its first flight only in 1944. It was accepted by TWA on behalf of the military on April the 16th, painted in TWA's colors, though showing its military serial number the following day the plane took off with Hughes himself at the controls. It flew non-stop from Burbank to Washington, a distance of 2,300 miles and a record time of 6 hours and 57 minutes. This was an average speed of 330 miles an hour, a respectable speed for a fighter of that era. In addition to the successful publicity for Hughes and the TWA, the event spotlighted the constellation to the mutual delight of Lockheed and the Army. After the record flight, the plane was kept in Washington for a week of displays and inspections before being delivered to the Army. Over the next 18 months, the C-69s were to make a number of significant long-distance flights and set a series of records. These included excessive transatlantic records, reducing flight time to Paris to under 10 hours. It was evident that the Army had found in the constellation a valuable personnel transport The C-69 could carry up to 64 fully armed troops, or alternatively, was capable of transporting a light tank or other medium vehicles. The underworked big engines returned excellent fuel consumption figures and combined with the plane's range, speed, and capacity to put the Constellation far ahead of its competitors. While this was not that relevant in 1945, it would be a telling advantage for Lockheed at war's end. Even though there was a clear need for cargo planes, the Army never placed a high priority on Constellation construction. Under Army direction, Lockheed concentrated on production of other warplanes. In addition to its own Hudson and Lightning designs, the company was heavily involved in construction of Boeing's B-17. Most of Lockheed's experience with four-engine planes during the war was with the Fortress rather than with the non-belligerent Connies. Lockheed produced many thousands of aircraft during the war, but only 22 of them would be C-69s. Army orders for hundreds of C-69s were never fulfilled. Only 15 had been delivered when the war ended, with another seven planes almost completed. In addition to Lockheed's production being directed to other types, the Constellation used the same engines as the B-29 Superfortress, and few of the power plants were allocated to the program. The engines had teething problems, and the shortage curl-tailed production. Testing was disrupted with frequent groundings of all types using them. At war's end, 12 of the 15 planes delivered to the Army were declared redundant. All military orders were cancelled and Lockheed paused to consider their options. The decision was made to go ahead with the Constellation as the company's primary product in the anticipated post-war expansion of commercial travel while their competitors tried to rebuild bombers into airlines or upgrade their pre-war designs, Lockheed were ideally positioned with a tested and proven aircraft that was very advanced in comparison to any other type available. By buying back C-69s from the Air Force, including those partially built at the factory, Lockheed were able to offer customer airlines new aircraft almost at war's end. Pan Am were the first to receive these refurbished Army planes, and the Connie made its first commercial flight on the 3rd of February 1946. Three days later, TWA introduced its Constellation service, first on the transatlantic route and then a month later commencing transcontinental flights in the US. Competing carriers were mostly relying on DC-4s, and the Connie had no problems outperforming the older Douglas plane. 
The efficiency of the constellation was undeniable, and within two years TWA's rivals on the transatlantic route had been forced to change to the Lockheed plane themselves. In effect, the Lockheed decision gave them an 18-month lead over their competitors at Boeing, Douglas, and Republic. This was clear to the airline operators as well. Within a week of the war's end, the company had orders from eight airlines for over 100 constellations. The contracts total over $75 million and allowed Lockheed to retain its skilled workforce as production of the Connies was stepped up. The original batch of ex-military planes was soon used up, and new examples started to roll from the factory. Though intended for civil use, they were still the basic C-69 as ordered for the Army. The plane had reverted from its military designation to the Lockheed project number. Thus, the basic aircraft was referred to as the Model 49. During the war, Lockheed had advanced five further studies for improved constellation variants, and these were given an extra numeral. The first being the Model 149, second 249, and so on. One of these projects had been for a long-range bomber variant of the plane, but the other four were all transport versions, three being improved civilian airliners. There were 73 civil Model 49s, including the recycled C-69s. Their immediate availability after the war gave Lockheed the time to refine the Connie further before releasing the first truly civilized version. For some carriers, the purchase of constellations propelled them into the big league. KLM was one. As early as November 1946, they had transferred their transatlantic route to Lockheed Model 49s, and the Connies served the airline well from then to the mid-50s. By that time, KLM was a major world airline, with a massively expanded network of routes. Work on what was to be the first civilian production model had begun in May 1945. This was the Model 649, developed in conjunction with Eastern Airlines. Among the many developments introduced with this model was the Speedpack external cargo bay. This was another example of Lockheed's team lateral thinking. A Connie offered little cargo space when laid out for maximum passenger carriage, but had the power to spare. To avoid cutting back on the number of passengers, additional cargo space was bolted to the outside of the plane. This increased the goods carriage by 8,000 pounds at a penalty of only 10 miles an hour in speed. The model also introduced a new and more powerful version of the engine, rated up to 2,500 horsepower. The 649 first flew on October the 18th, 1946. It was a notable advantage on the Model 49 in many aspects. Major improvements have been made to soundproofing and cabin air conditioning, giving a far more pleasant ride than any other airliner at the time. Easton began to advertise their planes as their gold plate Connies. They began operating services in May 1947. Overlapping with the deliveries of the Easton 649 came another new version, the 749. This had been developed as a long-range model for overseas operation, based closely on the Eastern aircraft. The outer wings contained additional fuel tanks, which added a further 1,000 miles to the range of the plane. With this version, the New York to Paris route could be flown non-stop. Further improvements to the 749 were recognized with the sub-designation 749A. Air India was the first to employ these, bringing them into service beside the earlier Connies then purchased. The improvements made to this version were directed to obtaining a higher gross takeoff weight, bringing an additional nearly 5,000 pounds to the payload. The weight of the Connie had grown markedly during her career to that time. The initial C-69 had a maximum weight of 72,000 pounds, but this had been expanded to 107,000 pounds with the 749A. 
At the same time, the range had been increased from 2,400 miles to well over 3,000. Many of the improvements made to these planes were later built into earlier models, blurring the distinctions between the earlier versions. The Constellation stood at what was to be the pinnacle of propeller-driven airliners. The technology of propellers themselves was very highly advanced. With its fully reversing blades, the Connie could pull itself up on landing in a very short time, or could back itself into a parking bay. The props could also be fully feathered to reduce drag if an engine cut out. Extreme use of the reversing props on landing produced this sort of spectacle, with the Constellation not only coming to a halt in a very short strip, but probably backing up. The Connie's props have been carefully matched to the huge engine chosen for the plane. The big blades caused some problems with the undercarriage in hoisting the plane clear of the ground, but these problems were offset by the advantages gained in flight. The big engines were run at very low revs, with no stress and minimum fuel consumption. They were quite capable of keeping the big plane aloft, even if two were cut out, and even if both of the engines on one side had to be shut down. By settling the plane to demand so little of its power plants in normal operation, Lockheed built in an enormous reserve. The 749, a specification had originally delivered from the renewed military interest. The original C-69s had been a problem aircraft for the Army, due in no small part to the experimental nature of design. The Army was well served by its large fleet of Douglas DC-4-derived C-54s, and abandoned the Lockheed plane. But when in 1948 the new US Air Force turned its attention to the Connie, it was no longer a new design that pushed the state of the art under wartime handicaps. This time, the Air Force bought a minor variant of the well proven airliner as a C 121A. Two were immediately redesignated as VIP aircraft and allocated to General MacArthur who transferred the name of his old C-54 Batan, and General Eisenhower, whose plane was known as Columbine. Later, VIP Connies were assigned to Eisenhower after he became president and were named Columbine II and Columbine III. The non-VIP C-121As were used as cargo and personnel transports, and had strengthened floors and large rear fuselage cargo doors. Over the next few years, the original Air Force order of 10 aircraft were all reconfigured as VIP planes. The first was delivered in December 1948, and the last in March 1949. They soldiered on for nearly 20 years of service and were not retired until the late 1960s. The return of the Constellation to Air Force service was followed by interest from the Navy and a new military role dawned for the plane. The C-121's career was to be very long and very influential and redefined the military use of large transport aircraft. By the time of the Columbine III, President Eisenhower's plane was a much different proposition from his first constellation. In the development of this new type, the story of the constellation returned to its beginning, to the first C-69 built. This had displayed its military number 310309, however its company number had been 1961, and it was as old as 1961 that it was to gain its individual fame. During the war, the first constellation had served its share of army duty. During this period, it was re-engined with Pratt & Whitney radials, 
as an emergency-driven response to the chronic problems with the right double cyclone engines. After this refurbishing, the Army took to calling it the XC-69E, though it was otherwise unchanged. At the end of the hostilities, it was then put up for sale and bought by none other than Howard Hughes. In 1949, he sold it back to Lockheed and a transformation began, as it was turned to the prototype for the Model 1049. The most obvious change was that the plane was stretched, and two new sections of the fuselage were built into it. One section before the wing added 10 feet and 9 inches, and the second behind the wing 7 feet and 8 inches. The alteration was so radical that the company marketed the plane under a new name, the Super Constellation. TWA had again been involved in the development of the plane, but Eastern Airlines had lodged its actual order first, and so they received the first Super Connies. In addition to the obvious lengthening, there were many other improvements. A better de-icing system for the wings, stiffed wing surfaces, increased fuel capacity, and more powerful engines were all incorporated. The gross takeoff weight of the plane increased by only 12%, but such was the efficiency of the design that the payload increased by 40%. Seating was available to cater for between 69 and 109 passengers as the Lockheed devised a variety of layouts. Some were designed for long-range carriers and others for commuter airlines. Other plans with fewer seats catered for routes with a higher proportion of freight, or allowed for the removal of fitting to use the aircraft as a part-time cargo plane when passenger traffic was light. The company's intent was clear. The Constellation had given them a captive market they did not want to lose. The new planes were assembled in Lockheed's appropriately named Hall of Giants. The first version had only a limited lifetime. It had been intended to give a new and revolutionary turbo-compounded engine, but teething problems with the new power plant that led to the use of standard though uprated radials. The 2,700 horsepower delivered by these engines left a consolation slower than its rival the Douglas DC-6, and only 24 were built. Lockheed were forced to persist with the introduction of the more powerful but underdeveloped new engines. Though problems persisted, the strategy paid off and sales picked up. With the introduction of the new engines, the plane received a further 20% boost in its weight-to-range ratio. All comparisons with the opposition were addressed, and all orders resumed their earlier, heartingly busy frequency. This beneficial change was in part forced on the company. They had had enough of unproven engines earlier in the Constellation's career. However, the military were very interested in an upgraded Superconny, and much less so in the underpowered original model. Not only did the re-engineering rekindle civilian sales, but the new super constellations were to be the testbed for a revolution in military aviation. Today, the concept of aerial command posts, electronic surveillance centers, and radar stations is commonplace. They've proved their worth in time, and again, during their short career. Most of the experimentation that proved their effectiveness was conducted in constellations, as was most of their early service. Again, old 1961 was involved in making aviation history. As with domes above and below, the original plane was used to trial the installations. The first Connies constructed as airborne radar pickets were built for the Navy. They replaced the earlier rudimentary installations aboard converted World War II bombers. Aboard the planes, a crew of 22 were involved with aircrew, radar operations, and engineers. 
With their long range, coupled to the search range of the extensive load of equipment, these Navy WV-1s, for the worth of the concept, and installed it as an accepted part of naval practice. Soon, the idea spread to the Air Force. The Air Force had placed orders for Supercanis for conventional use as transports, but C-121s would not be delivered as such until 1956. Before any transports could be built, the Air Force acknowledged their better use as an airborne early warning aircraft and changed the order for the first 10 to its own flying radar pickets as RC-121Cs. These planes are loaded with 15,000 pounds of radar equipment, with crews at 335 miles an hour up for 24 hours on patrol. The RC-121C was similar to early Navy Super Connies, with their height-finding radar housed in the 8-foot-tall hump, and the bearing scanner located in the ventral dome. The RC-121Cs entered service in 1953, and were mostly employed in patrolling the western seaboard of the USA. They were followed in 1954 by the first of an order for 72 RC-121D Warning Star aircraft. In addition to the passive role of detection, these incorporated offensive activity as the control centers for the guidance of fighter interceptors. From the basis of the Morning Star, a number of options presented themselves. Once, the idea of putting equipment into aircraft was suggested. There was a rush of ideas about which equipment might be suited for the treatment. Advanced electronics and surveillance types multiplied. As the transport planes appeared, they were often pulled back to the factory for refit as one or another of the electronics versions. The appetite of services for these valuable aircraft was insatiable. Over 220 of the main types alone were built, disregarding the one-offs and the small runs. Most of these planes were also completely re-equipped at least once in their lifetime. Between the Air Force and the Navy, over 25 different designations were used to identify versions of the radar-equipped Connies and their control center brethren. In addition to proving the concept and paving the way to their success, these constellations also performed very real service in an era when there was no other practical solution. At the height of the Cold War, when hostility and distrust often combined in equal degree to foreign policy, a calmer picture of reality was maintained by these electronic eyes in the sky. In 1962, the RC designation was changed to EC, and the electronic Connies were to earn their later Vietnam fame under that designation. They were a pivotal factor in the US defensive strategy, and had become as important as the cargo-carrying versions that were dispensable. Despite using non-standard fuel and requiring piston engine maintenance that was in almost dead arc form, the Connies were nursed along. Old age and technological redundancy could not undermine their essential functions, and some were to remain in service until the early 1980s. Their longevity was helped not only by their experts' care, but by the excellence of their original design and construction. The jet age was, however, drying in on the Constellation's career. It was obvious that the introduction of the jet airliners would change the whole market expectation, and Lockheed were determined not to be left behind. Aware of the limitations of early jet technology, they set about refining a system of compound engines, or jet props, using jet engines to drive propellers. They had already extended the piston engine by the use of turbines driven by the exhausts. These had added 20% more power to the engines and with the peak of the piston engine development. Employing a jet and prop combination was designed to extract maximum economical efficiency from both technologies. Once again, the testbed for aviation milestone was old 1961. 
In its last major notable achievement, the venerable airframe was fitted with an Allison turboprop in the outboard starboard position. This engine couldn't save the Connie, but it was part of the foundation of one of Lockheed's most successful aircraft, the C-130 Hercules. It was also at the heart of the successful Lockheed Electra, which kept the company alive in the civilian market. However, for the Constellation, its success as the pinnacle of piston engineer liners somehow acted against anyone taking a jet-powered version seriously, even though the finest development, the Starliner, was yet to come. With a new wing shape and other major revisions, the Starliner carried Lockheed's hopes of continued dominance of the long range airliner market. However, though orders for Super Connies didn't dry up immediately, there was no flood of orders for the new plane. Only 44 of the vastly improved version were built, phased out of service relatively quickly, being replaced by jets. The improvements made to the Starliner were numerous, and it was undoubtedly the finest piston engine airliner of all time, but it was too late. Lockheed's enterprise imagination and innovation continued to work around the Constellation, and several refinements, including the now familiar revolving antenna, were developed and tested with Connie's. The new development of the Starliner gave Lockheed a proposal to put the Air Force, and the company invested considerable time and money sorting out the best package it could develop around the plane. The revolving dish was only one of the systems developed for the submission. With turboprops, extended range, specialized layouts, and a large number of new features and improvements, the Starliner was being prepared for what would be the next sales opportunity. By then, the success of the airborne radar and control planes that the fleet of such an aircraft be maintained. The aging C-121s would need a replacement. By the time the competition was announced, Lockheed knew that no matter how excellent their proposal was, they didn't really stand a chance. Hot on the heels of the formal call for tenders came the specifications, and these confirmed Lockheed's fears. Time had stolen a march on the military Starliner as well as the civilian version. The Air Force was not just in the market for a replacement, but for their constellations to be more precise. They were in the market for a jet-powered plane. The Boeing Company had the world's best such aircraft on its catalog. Developed for the Air Force as a jet tanker, the KC-135, the result of a foregone conclusion. However, the appearance of the replacement did not signal the end of the Connie's military career. Whereas the arrival of Boeing's jet had seen the quick demise of civilian constellations, the Air Force and Navy were content with the capabilities of the plane. And coincidentally, they had need of them. The U.S. Air Force C-121s, to be based in the Asian theater, arrived in Thailand in April 1965. Although Navy planes had been the first Connies involved, Starting with the missions in August 1964 at the time of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, the constellations flew throughout the war and their service was invaluable. They performed in a number of functions, some of which were developed and tested as a response to the armed combat raging below and in the air around them. The big plane's commodious fuselages saw many refits. The variety of constellations deployed to Vietnam illustrates the way the big planes had taken on so many roles for the services. Their main work was as an airborne early warning aircraft, but they were also used for a number of other missions. A few cargo versions were used primarily for aerial medical evacuation and as passenger planes. However, beyond that, the specialist electronic planes filled a number of roles. One of these was the relay of data from sensors scattered along the North Vietnamese supply routes as a part of Operation Igloo White. To have diverted the jets to these tasks when they were needed as refueling tankers would have been highly impractical, and the Connies, available and reliable, soldiered on.
The constellation's original deployment to Vietnam was essentially defensive. They were to be used to provide a radar picket to guard against North Vietnamese bombers attacking targets in the south. However, this proved to be a short-lived need and the duties that kept them in the theater were over a broad spectrum. One of the most unusual roles the Connie was called on to perform fell to this plane, and in C-121J of the Navy's Development Squadron, PX-8. The designation was given to a group of planes that were variously modified to secret specifications. There was no conformity within the designation. It was effectively a grab bag for various one-off Connie versions. This plane, for example, had its own special fit and its own special mission. The equipment fitted to this plane was definitely non-standard in military terms. These two-inch tape players were the ultimate in professional television formats at the time. The duty of the aircraft was to serve as television and radio broadcaster for the armed services networks. By hauling the transmission aloft, the service was taken out of range of the Et Cong interference. Ground-based transmissions would have required infrastructure which as a tempting target would have needed constant guard. The quietly plotting constellation transmitting from on high made the maintenance of the service broadcasts practical. Of course, most of the constellation activity in Vietnam was far more actively involved in the conflict, with most of the important work being performed in monitoring the North Vietnamese. As soon as the operations over the North began, the constellations became essential factors in the struggle. As the war went on, their role gradually evolved from passive to active involvement. Operating over their own ground, the North Vietnamese MiGs were given very accurate information about the whereabouts of US aircraft in their airspace. This advantage was at first simply countered by the operations of the US radar planes, which were able to relay similar information about MiG activity to the American strike aircraft. As the war went on, the Connies increasingly assumed a more active role, making direct contact with American fires and guiding them in attack on any North Vietnamese activity. When the North became better equipped with missiles, the Connies were able to fix the location of any SAM site radars that were operating. This served two purposes. It warned the aircraft in the area to expect trouble and it led the Iron Hand weasels to attack the sites. The last constellation operations in the theater were flown in May of 1974. Well after the last operational strikes by the US forces, the big observers continued their monitoring. By then, it was 25 years after the first electronic refitted Connie and so impressed the Navy. It was also 31 years after the first constellation flight. When the constellation was at its peak, the axe fell. They were forcibly retired from service long before they wore out. The major airlines were forced, partially for reasons of prestige, to abandon props. The Connies have been the key to the establishment of long-distance civil traffic after the war, but business has no place for soft sentiment, and they were abandoned quickly. By the early 60s, the civil career of the constellation had moved to small airlines and lesser routes. There, they continued to work for many years. Gradually, they become relegated to cargo, and then lingered further as isolated crop dusters and fire tankers. The military career lasted much longer, with the last Navy constellation being retired in June 1982. The last constellation built had been delivered in 1958. 856 Connies were made in 16 years of production. Their career stretches from World War II to the Space Shuttle. They were, throughout their career, used as test beds for a multitude of developments. The results of this service are still seen in use in both military and civil aviation today. One of the most beautiful aircraft ever produced, 
time reduced their worth to weight in metal. Very few escaped the scrap merchants, and now they're treasured museum pieces. As we uh, key up our uh, video for our introduction video, I will recognize our Sleeping Dog Productions air-to-air -air TV crew and uh, invite our guests to come out. We have an extremely talented uh, production crew. Scott Guyatt leads that team. Kyle Guyatt does all the, the work taking care of everybody. Gentlemen, if you'd like to come out here, you can see uh, the video screen. The, the Jumbotron here and uh, see the great work of uh, Scott Guyatt as we watch the introduction for the Constellation Batan. Down at Boeing Plaza tonight, there is a very rare and significant aircraft. It is the Lockheed VC-121A Constellation, serial number 48613, known as Bataan. In 1948, the U.S. Air Force ordered 10 Lockheed Model L749 aircraft, the Graceful Constellation Airliner. They were delivered in 1948 and 1949 to Westover Air Force Base and the Atlantic Division of the Military Air Transport Command, MATS for short. Their Air Force designation was C-121A. One of the first major international crises of the Cold War began on June 24, 1948, when the Soviets closed all road, rail, and canal access to the parts of Berlin, Germany that were controlled by the Western Allies. The Berlin blockade left the people of West Berlin without their normal supplies of food, fuel, medicines, and other necessities. In response, the Western Allies organized the Berlin Airlift. Round-the-clock flights from England and the United States brought essential supplies to the people of West Berlin. The Lockheed Constellations, with their speed and long range, were ideal for moving supplies from the U.S. to Britain and to Germany during the Berlin Airlift. The Air Force's eight C-121As, also known as Connies, made continuous crossings of the Atlantic Ocean, flying over five million miles to help deliver relief to West Berlin. When the airlift ended, the Connies were converted from cargo planes to high-speed VIP transports for the U.S. Air Force. In 1950, during the Korean War, Connie No. 613 became the flying command post of General Douglas MacArthur, who was at the time Supreme Commander of Allied Powers in Korea. MacArthur named his constellation Bataan, after the Philippine Peninsula, known for the infamous Bataan Death March of 1942, when 75,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war were brutally force-marched more than 60 miles to captivity in POW camps. 
subjected by Imperial Japanese troops to hunger, thirst, beatings, torture, and wanton killing, more than 5,000 Filipinos and 500 Americans died or were killed during the eight days of the march. Many more would die in the POW camps of torture, starvation, or disease. In Korea, General MacArthur made 17 flights over the battlefields in his county, and she carried him to Wake Island for a meeting with U.S. President Harry Truman. On April 16, 1951, a fateful day for MacArthur, the Connie Batan carried the general from Korea to Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, where President Truman relieved him of his command. MacArthur then flew home to San Francisco his last flight in the Connie. C-121A Bataan was assigned to the Pacific Air Command based in Hawaii. Her passengers included Generals Matthew Ridgway, Mark Clark, and Curtis LeMay, and South Korean President Syngman Rhee. In 1953, Bataan carried newly elected U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon on an inspection tour of Korea. All C-121s, including Bataan, were removed from Air Force roles in 1966 and sent to the Boneyard at davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. Several were stripped of military gear and sold to civilian operators in Canada for use as fire bombers and bug sprayers. Three Connies, including number 613, Bataan, were assigned to NASA for use during the Apollo Space Program. When the Apollo Space Program ended, NASA 422 was acquired by the Army Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker in Alabama and put on display out in the open, and there she sat for 20 years. Officials at Fort Rucker considered scrapping Bataan in 1993 until Ed Maloney, founder of the Plains of Fame Museum in Chino, California, offered to take possession of her. That's a historic airplane, he told skeptical Steve Hinton, president of Plains of Fame. We've got to find a way to do it. Plains of Fame traded a helicopter for the Connie, made her airworthy with help from Lockheed repainted her in General MacArthur's colors and took her on the airshow circuit. But flying her was costly and after one year on the circuit, Bataan was grounded once again, perhaps permanently. Enter Rod Lewis, well-known aircraft collector and owner of Lewis Air Legends and the Air Legends Foundation. Lewis purchased Bataan in 2015 and hired Steve Hinton's Fighter Rebuilders Company to undertake Bataan's complete restoration. Finding parts wasn't easy and few people knew anything about the 1950s era airliner. Making Bataan flyable again was, said Hinton, like restoring 10 or 15 Mustangs. But despite the difficulties, Bataan once again took to the air on June 20th of this year, just in time for the trip to Oshkosh. She proudly wears the colors of General MacArthur's transport and will soon be given an all-new, historically correct interior. Lewis plans to fly Bataan to events around the U.S. and maybe Europe and beyond. So Bataan will be seen and appreciated by thousands thanks to Ed Maloney's vision to save her from scrappers and Rod Lewis's dream to bring this beautiful and historic airplane back to life. Okay, now, now you've heard the recorded history of uh, Bataan, so gentlemen, Rod, would you join me here, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Which seat uh, are we in? How about this one right here for okay. you, Rod? Okay. 
Sounds good. Does that put you in, or would you rather be here in the shade? No. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm fine. All right. Thank you. Steve, if you'll sit next to Rod, and uh, we'll put um, Stuart on the end. Okay. That's a good place for you, isn't it? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, honored to be here with these three gentlemen. Rod Lewis, Steve Hinton, and Stuart Dawson. They represent the Warbird community. Uh, and the um, professionals, the uh, dedicated people who, who have done so much for all of the Warbird aircraft. And now we have this uh, Bataan. So Rod, tell me, um, what possessed you to think that you uh, wanted to restore something of this uh, major undertaking? You know, Connie, um, I'm honored here, first of all, to, to be here with, with my teammates to uh, represent, you know, our, our airplane that's supposed to be here, should be here tomorrow, uh, and your namesake. Uh, but I think what, I asked that question many times, actually, what possessed me to do this? <laughs> I think uh, it started probably in 2012. Uh, Steve and I made a trip over to the Ukraine and we were looking for a large project. And in, in this case, it was a TU-95 Bear. And we went over there, checked it out. It was not nothing like we were told. Hadn't been flown in 10 years. We, we were told it was started up every three months. And so we got pretty discouraged after that, came home and I, and I asked Steve, what, what can we do that's a big project that we can enjoy as we, we get older and we can fly as a crew and uh, Steve came up with an idea that at, at his museum in uh, Arizona that they had a Connie. So it just started from there, and Steve, you can pick it up and that explain is a, a little big, more. That is a big project. Uh, <laughs> and uh, let me do just a little production here. If you guys would like to be in the shade, you could move your chairs up just a little bit uh, if you'd like, and you'll be in the shadow of this beautiful Corsair that also happens to belong to Rod Lewis. But that just keeps you guys out oh, of the yeah, sun a little better. bit. So, uh, no, much better, huh? You okay. Okay. Well, yeah, Rod's just going to yeah, leave yeah. you guys yeah. over there completely. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Steve, tell us uh, about the project, the beginning with Ed Maloney, uh, with his vision was amazing. Well, it, it's kind of a funny story. You know, for the air race game, we're friends with uh, Wiley Sanders Group out of Troy, Alabama there. And one day I got a phone call at the shop that uh, from his guys said, uh, you know what, Fort Rucker has this constellation sitting there. And, um, you know, it's probably available if you guys want it. You know, you're a museum and all, and we know you. And, and uh, so I said, oh, I don't think so. I mean, we, we, you know, we're strapped just taking care of what we have. But anyway, I uh, mentioned it to Ed Maloney the next day, and Ed just like he stood up and said, "Really? He said, we got to get that airplane." And I was like, uh, "Well, Ed, we can't afford to put that together." He says, "We'll find a way." So anyway, against uh, I, I wasn't you know too convincing to talk him out of it, but uh, God bless Ed for that, and uh, that's what we did. And we and it turned out it it, it kind of unfolded because as uh, we made a trade for it and we got it and it just co happened to be a retired vice president from Lockheed who lived uh, in Ontario, California, north of Chino, heard that we had it and he was actually a crew chief on the airplane when MacArthur had it <clears throat> and so he, through his connections at Lockheed, uh, organized uh, some restoration and we, we flew it to Dothan. Uh, well, we sent our guys uh, there for about five or six months to get it flying. It hadn't flown in almost 20 years and uh, put a crew together and flew it over to Dothan and Dothan uh, stripped all the NASA paint off of it and put in MacArthur's markings and then uh, um, yeah, then it went to Addison, Texas and they put an interior, a replica of the MacArthur interior in it and then came to Chino. Uh, so uh, we operated it for uh, several air shows but it just was very evident we could either fly the Connie or fly about 10 or 12 of the other airplanes. You know, that's what it would take to really maintain it correctly. So we ended up taking it out to our museum out in Arizona and put it on display. You know, it's a desert. It's a good place for an airplane like that. And then right on the highway and all. And then, uh, like Rod had mentioned, uh, our conversations and uh, we, you know, an aviation museum that we are, you know, we're, we, we don't have excess funds, but uh, Rod seemed kind of interested and uh, uh, Rod went and looked at it and we figured, well, it'd be worth our time. And uh, Rod said he was willing to uh, commit to it, and uh, 
Rod is the hero in all this airplane, by the way. We did the work, but Rod was the one who st stuck it out. Uh, you mentioned uh, funding uh, a restoration shop for eight years doing a constellation. And it's, it's, you know, we went through the whole airplane. We you know, rewired it. Well, we took everything out of it first. You know, we had the outer wings off, we had the landing gear out of it, we had all the engines off. and and. Uh, we went through an eight-year process getting it all back together and uh, real happy with where we are right now. So it, uh, we're anxious to get it here so you can all see it. Well, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's certainly from the, the pictures, I know everyone is uh, really looking forward to seeing it because it, uh, it is beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, Stuart, <clears throat> you have the uh, pleasure of uh, flying it. Uh, so tell us a little bit, uh, I know you fly a lot of airplanes, so how does the, uh, the uh, Bataan compare? Well, uh, or does it? I flew a lot of forage and stuff hauling freight you know, early in my life, and uh, but I never had a hold of a Connie, and it is amazing what that airplane will do. It uh, it really will will get on down the road. It it runs fast. Um, it it uh, it's a little bit heavy to fly. But uh, that's uh, hydraulics from the 40s, you know. That's the way it was. I, I believe the airplane, speaking of fast, I believe it set a few speed records in its day, and it really is uh, ahead of its time as far as when it was designed and when it was used. Yeah. This, this thing, if you fill it up, you can run 20 hours on it. I don't think we <laughs> don't sign me up, right? <laughs> uh, and you really don't want to fill it up. No, you don't want to pay that bill. No, I don't want to pay that bill either. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody would. Uh, so, Rod, tell me, uh, I mean, I know you're disappointed the airplane is not here today, uh, but it will be here tomorrow. Uh, they, they had a, a little... Uh, hiccup. I think Bernie called that a hiccup earlier today in one of their airplanes. So you do have hiccups with these old airplanes. So um, you have to be extremely proud that this project has uh, come to fruition. Well, thank you. It's not complete yet. As mentioned in the it's in the video, we don't have a complete interior, but as soon as the interior gets finished, it, it should be a really, really nice airplane. It is already. And proof of that it does fly, a video. So, yeah, video. so we've got. Um, first of all, I'm I'm not the hero. These guys that worked eight and a half years, we worked eight months just to get it airworthy, to fly it from Arizona to Chino. And those guys were super dedicated every day working on this airplane. Got it to Chino, and then eight years, some eight years later, uh, we we June twentieth, we finally got to. To, to fly it for the first time, I was in a in a chase plane, and a lot of those videos were, were from from that day. But um, I, I I'm very proud of mainly the team that's put this all together, and and them sticking with it because it was uh, there were some hard times, especially during COVID. Couldn't get parts, couldn't get people. You know, it was just very tough, and it it went right through COVID. Uh, Steve did all he could to just keep it running. You know, so. I want to thank them. Well, yeah, and, and you his know, guys. We, we should yeah. all, you know, in, any of us who fly airplanes, we don't recognize the crew chiefs and the maintenance people often enough, but uh, they're the guys that, uh, that keep us going. And of course, Steve does all of it with, the, with his team. How many people do you have working there in Chino, or do well, you know? Uh, it, it goes, uh, we, we always have a, around 10 to 14, kind of, right? But we had at times we had 14 people working on this, you can imagine. You know, when you, you drill skins off and you, you're removing parts and cleaning parts and looking for parts and it really goes on and on and on. Um, vintage V12, sorry, vintage radials, excuse me. Uh, Mike Nixon did the engines for us. Mm -hmm. And they're a hybrid engine. Uh, they used a, uh, a power case and nose case off of uh, the latest turbo compounded 3350 and put it on the early blower so it all fit in the same cowling and the same engine mount. And, uh, you know, we just have a, a lot of experience through the years, and we found ways to make it happen. We uh, modified the electrical system. You can imagine the 1940s, electro, 50s electrical system. It, uh, there were wires, I mean, a 1,000 pounds of wires going through that thing, you know, because it was pressurized and heated and air-conditioned and, and, and of that era. And we made it more like a warbird. We wanted to make it as simple as we could so we could maintain it. So it's, uh, we're real proud of what we've done, and when you see it, you'll, you'll, 
you'll agree it's yeah. a really, really nice detailed airplane. And uh, we another thing too, we got to match the rest of Rod's airplanes. You know, when you know Rod, every one of Rod's planes is a, is a gem, and we just want to make sure that we keep that. <coughs> Well, there's a rod. Well, they you're right. You, you have a high standard here uh, with the Lewis collection uh, to to live up to. Uh, that's so. If I understood you correctly, these engines are for this airplane. They are specific to um, this constellation. Yeah, but I mean, they're the parts that are available, and it's not a major change in any way. The same. We use the reduced power settings that were uh, assigned to that earlier engine. Um, it's still a 2,500 horsepower engine, but the parts are a 3,500 horsepower engine. So they're the very latest evolution of that right cycle on 3350. And um, uh, Vintage Radials has the largest uh, inventory of that. Uh, part of our deal with him is his, he would use as many new parts as he could. And uh, most of the engines have all new, you know, cranks, rods, cylinders, and cases. They're like new stuff. It really is. And it... Uh, it's really clean. It uh, doesn't drip much oil. And we're used no. to working with 3350s on Sky Raiders that are always oily and spitting everywhere. And you see in the in the uh, video there when it starts up, it looks kind of like a. It just spits smoke out. It doesn't even spit oil out. We're really impressed with it. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's cool. As you say, radials. If it has any oil in it, you're going to see some of that oil coming it's got out. Fifty some gallon oil. You better see some out. <laughs> better, better see some it, come it, out. It better, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, Stu, tell us uh, uh, again your impression of uh, the engines, the operation of the airplane. Uh, um, so what's different uh, of, about operating this airplane, say, than uh, a, a single-engine airplane with this basic same engine? Well, we've got four of them to you take got four care of. of. Yeah, yeah, all right. And um, it takes three people to fly this airplane, a pilot, co-pilot, and then you've got an engineer. And the engineer basically <clears throat> operates everything. You start and initiate what we're doing, like takeoff power, and he sets it. And <clears throat> anything you want and you need, you just tell the engineer, and they'll do it. So it's really, you got to get coordinated. Everybody's got to work together on this thing. Well, that's what it's, it's very important. You call for the power in the You engineer call for what you want, and he will give it to you. So is your engineer, no, I'm sure your engineer is still over uh, with the airplane probably. Yeah, he's still with the airplane. So we can say thank you to him because he's, he's probably the most important part of this. Uh, they're this, this they're working engineer. real hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, that that's really good. Uh, Steve, would you make a shout out to uh, anyone else here in the audience or any of your crew who made this possible. What was what was a high point and a low point in this eight-year restoration? Well, um, when you say a high point, well, when, when uh, Stu and I shoved the throttles up for takeoff and we both looked at each other, boy, this thing goes. We, you know, it hit 100 <laughs> knots and 1,500 feet. We were kind of, okay, let's go, you know. It, it was really surprising, but we were 50,000 pounds below gross weight, so that's part of it, but... Um, it, uh, that that was the, probably the high point of uh, you know the whole thing coming together and we finally flying the airplane. And like Rod said, the low point there, during the COVID years, uh, you know everybody is struggling and and uh, uh, you know there was we were down about it, but uh, we we all stuck with it and uh, but it, it, we had so much enthusiasm with the, with the people that uh, we were doing business with. You know everybody was excited about being involved with the constellation. So. Sure, yeah. and it and it is gorgeous. So, who polished this airplane? Um, there was a company that was hired to do it, and uh, they polished. There was nine people on it for eight weeks, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was done there at Chino, and they made a big, giant mess. It was just a, that fuzz going everywhere. But uh, and they were every day black face, you know, from all the polish. But they were smiling, you know. It, it, everybody loved working on it. it really did. Well, yeah, yeah, that yeah, that's a big. I mean, you can polish a prop and be worn out, you know, if you're uh, one individual. So I can see where you hire somebody. Yeah, when so, Rod came up with a paint job, he's got oh, polish, ooh, 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 ooh. But ooh. I'm glad he did because <laughs> it really makes the airplane. It's it's you know it's it's beautiful. So, okay, Rod, tell us. I mean, we covered a lot of the history of the airplane uh, in the video, but tell us what part of the history means the most to you or, or led you to uh, make sure you replicated the uh, MacArthur years? 
I think just basically that it was MacArthur's kind of office in the sky, you know, and uh, it, it flew to many different important areas of the world. And um, I think that's, I just wanted to make sure that we were representing MacArthur properly and um, just wanted it just like it was or better, so. Well, and, that, and that's what, you know, we, we do here in More Words in Review, it's uh, history, heritage, and the heroes. Yeah. And you certainly helped us on many occasions to present that and record this for generations to come so that they'll know what, what these airplanes did and what they meant. Uh, and so, okay, so tell me a little bit about this airplane uh, while we have it sitting here. We don't want to just ignore it. I mean, it's pretty nice too. You know? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's one of the first Warbirds that I bought. I think uh, I, I had to buy this to get a, to get a, uh, a Bearcat. So I bought a Dash 1 Bearcat with this. Uh, probably in, uh, boy, that was 20, 20 years ago. So, um, I'd always wanted a Corsair, always wanted a Bearcat, so the package deal was just perfect. Perfect. So, so what was your first Warbird? First Warbird was actually a T-28C, and I flew that for many years, bought that in 1994, and brought it to Oshkosh, did, did some work on it, brought it to Oshkosh, and it won Best, best T-28 in 1995. And then my second Warbird was a Whirlaway to get some tail tailwheel time. And that was a beautiful airplane. George Baker out of Florida built that one. And uh, just loved flying that. And then kind of my next one was an NA-50. And then uh, I guess the following was a Mustang. Then I got, finally got to a Mustang, so. Okay, Stuart, what was the first uh, Warbird or what was the first airplane that you flew at what age? Uh, <clears throat> I went to the airport when I was 16 because I had to have a job. I couldn't put gas in my car, and I never left. I just stayed there, and uh, I worked there uh, doing the line and fueling airplanes and learned how to fly and just never went up, you know, never stopped. You never grew up. I never grew up. Never grew up. That's a good thing. Don't want to. Yeah, Steve, you know, we, we've heard over the years the Chino the Chino boys or the Ed Maloney guys, uh, tell, tell me a little bit about the history of Chino and Ed Maloney and you guys that, that worked as line boys, I understand, out there. Well, I actually started way before that. We were just, you know, when I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was in second grade, uh, when the nun left the, the, I tell everybody, when the nun leaves, right, you go in the chalk bar and you, you start drawing airplanes, right? But there was a mm -hmm. kid on the third row over from me that could draw better airplanes than I could. And that was Jim Maloney, that was Ed's son and my wife's father. So, And uh, in a young age, I just had the opportunity. Ed opened the door for Jim and I to, uh, you know, be part of the museum. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're eight or nine years old and hanging around the museum, all you're doing is, you know, causing problems for the people that are serious about it. But you grow up and a lot of great mentors. I actually got a late start flying. Uh, I was 15 the first time I ever left the in an airplane, ever flew in an airplane, but uh, yeah, yeah, like three, four years later, I found a Mustang, so. And the first time I came to Oshkosh was 50 years ago. Wow. Yeah, I brought uh, P-51 here, Leroy Pennell's Mustang, and then Jim was flying the museum's Hellcat, so. Oh, let me, no, I'm not gonna count. 73, the first time. <laughs> 1973. Well, you're, yeah. That's yeah. uh, that's pretty impressive, and you've been here most a lot of a lot yeah, of the probably years. Majority of the times, yeah. Majority yeah, of so. the times. Well, first time I ever got paid to fly an airplane, I got flying an F eighty six for Bob Hoover in nineteen seventy four. I brought an F eighty six or yeah, that white one with the red stripe. If you ever see an old picture with a with a kid that uh, working on it, that was me. All right. Well, Bob Bob Hoover uh, was a mentor for a lot of people and uh, had a lot of good words of wisdom. And uh, you know, it was uh, it was uh, really neat to know some of these people. And that's what we're we're glad we've preserved you know their history and their stories here. And uh, now we carry on with the airplanes. And uh, tomorrow we're gonna you have to see a lot of the Corsairs out here. I asked Rod earlier. Uh, I don't know. The question was kind of like why why did you why is the Corsair here? And he said. Because you asked me to bring it, you know, so, okay. <laughs> so uh, what can we look for next year, Rod? Uh, I don't know how you top a constellation. Well, next, year, next year we'll have a full-blown, completed Connie, 
first of all. Oh, yeah, with interior. Yeah, with an interior in it, with uh, 24 seats, actually. So, um, I don't know. Depends on what you're doing next year and what you need. That's so. <laughs> what I asked for. I have to be careful <laughs> what you right. asked for. Here. Uh, okay, so um, we're, this is going to be a, a shorter than normal uh, Warbridge Review because it is the afternoon, and uh, we're, they're going to start the night show here in uh, just a little little while. But uh, would you guys be open to offering it out for questions if we have anybody uh, who sure. uh, has a question out there? Uh, sure. We can uh, we take this. I don't know if that I have my mic handlers yet, but maybe uh, maybe if you raise your hand, I can walk over and uh, there you go, a close one. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there a time for it to arrive tomorrow? Is there a time for it to arrive tomorrow? Hopefully, it's going to be in the morning. We're waiting and we're coordinating this with uh, the people who, where the aircraft is now, but <clears throat> it's up and. Um, we're going to get over as quick as we can to get it back here. Okay, this gentleman. I'm a young warbird buff. I love it. And how do you recommend a young person get into warbirds? Steve, you're probably the one. You've got to make yourself available. And, uh, okay, you start at the bottom. I mean, you meet people and uh, offer to help and, you know, find somebody you're comfortable with, some group you're comfortable with. It's a... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of great people right here in this audience, too. You could probably uh, make a nuisance of yourself and get in somehow. Okay. Mike okay. Is yes, I was going to ask that in the movie The Aviator, they happened to have the Connie that and they were talking about having the births. And so I wanted to know, is it going to be buttons or snaps? <laughs> don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and, and while we're waiting for the next uh, question, I, I think we recognize Steve. Uh, in the morning, we're going to have uh, Adam Makos here for uh, devotion uh, with the Corsairs. And Steve had a lot to do with the uh, devotion movie. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, we, are, are you planning a movie with a constellation with the Bataan, you think? Uh -huh. Or uh, let's write a script, huh? Yeah. Maybe no, we should. Sorry. Maybe we should. Yeah, maybe we should. Let's <laughs> yeah. do it. Hey, you haven't done that yet, have you? Doing movies? No, no hey, it's, it's not for me. Yeah. <laughs> no, Devotion is a great project. You know, we got a phone call, and uh, Fred Smith from FedEx wanted to come out and talk about Devotion with his two daughters. They have a production company called Black Label. And so uh, Fred shows up with his two daughters. I mean, they're a regular company, but anyway, uh, uh, he wanted to talk about doing this movie. He says, it's a great book. And my wife, Karen, had read the book. And she says she was so excited about it because you know, it's a best-selling book. And you know, it's a great story. Um, funny part, uh, we talked a little bit in the office. And, uh, and then started. I uh, took Fred and his uh, the people for a tour. And went through the first, our first hangar and talked about the airplanes. And uh, Fred, Fred Smith, everybody knows who he is, right? FedEx. He's the fellow that started FedEx. Anyway, he looked out there, and we have an OV-1 in the corner outside. Hey, oh, I used to work on those things. Anyway, for the next 45 minutes, he gave the tour at the museum. He knew every airplane we had. I, I couldn't believe it. He was just talk, 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 mm -hmm. talk. Quite a personality. But a year later, um, Kevin LaRosa Jr., who you probably met, uh, um, who's a, a, a young... Uh, aerial director now, and an outstanding person and very accomplished uh, aviator as well. You know, he was assigned as aerial coordinator on the show, and so we sat down and figured out, uh, you know, first of all, what's the budget? You know, uh, the, you know, it could go on and on. Yeah, you start with uh, several people that are here. We even talked to them about using our airplanes, but then, of course, they narrow it down. But we ended up with uh, three Corsairs that we used for the whole show. Uh, we started in Wenatchee, Washington, Korea. Uh, did a lot of flying there. We were we were there um, at the airport for <clears throat> Wenatchee. I think we were there for about five weeks. I think um, you know some days it was snowing, couldn't do it. Some days we you know it was a nice day, or we just bared down and did it. And we had the Corsairs and um, had a Sky Raider from Ericsson. So we had uh, Ericsson's Corsair, Ericsson Sky Raider. We had our museum F4U1. Uh, Dan Freakins F4U4, and then we brought our MiG-15 up there too to do some scenes. And then uh, from there we went to Pasco, Washington, and uh, did all that stuff. If you watch the movie around the, the uh, river and the lake, uh, did it there. And then we took a break for a little while and uh, 
got the Bearcats and uh, Rod Seafury. <clears throat> and we went to Savannah with the Corsairs and we based out of Savannah. And uh, we set up Rod Seafury. He has a two place Seafury. Took the instrument panel out of the back and uh, painted the tail blue. And we put the actors in the back of the uh, Seafury. And uh, John Maloney and I did the Bearcat scenes. Uh, if you see the movie, some of the best Bearcat stuff you'll see. Anyway, <laughs> we did so much stuff. And of course, they only used five minutes, but we had a ball. You know, when you're doing a movie, you get to do stuff that's way, you know, kind of usually illegal, but you got a waiver to do. But buzzing the beach and looping and rolling and formation rolls and stuff like that. They used a few little things, but uh, it was a, a real great experience and uh, it was great uh, income for the museum and, uh, you know, all our guys were working on it. It was a great show and Rod let us take some vacation away from the Connie for a couple of months. That was, that was a big deal. But uh, it was a good movie and uh, unfortunately it has a really sad ending, but um, uh, we were real proud of it. Well, I think we can all be proud of the uh, the integrity of uh, the uh, the people like you know Jesse Brown and uh, Tom Hudner, who uh, who are uh, veterans and uh, fly for their buddies. That's what Bud Anderson says. You know, I was flying for my buddies, and uh, a lot of them didn't come home. So uh, to our veterans, we owe uh, a great debt, and to you guys. And and I wanted to bring that in for the interaction and the the connections of all the Warbird people. I see the uh, Warbird people out here who also operate these airplanes. It's a very close-knit community, and, um, you know, everybody is... Warbirds is a little different because we are here to showcase the airplanes in tribute to uh, all the people who served. And um, I, I know we have a, a... Oh, do I have to go to that question now? Mr. Roush has a question. I'm sorry, you're trumped. Mr. Roush? <laughs> I want to make a statement about uh, the museum that uh, my first contact with it. I started drag racing na nationally in 76, and the first time I uh, hit uh, the West Coast, I was at Pomona, and uh, they had uh, they, the, the Hellcat uh, on the display at the, at, the, at the grandstands, which was uh, piqued my interest. And I went looking for the museum after practice one day, and uh, I went uh, found Chino, and uh, the B-17 was outside. And uh, do you still have the same B-17? Same one, yeah. I uh, asked if I could go through it, and uh, the person I was talking to, uh, whose name I, I, I never knew, said I could, but I had to leave a $5 uh, uh, contribution for the museum. So I got my $5 down, and uh, he uh, opened up the B-17, and I went through it for about 30 minutes. And I uh, really enjoyed uh, my first uh, trip to, uh, to California. My first visit uh, to an aircraft museum and my first exposure to Chino. Thanks, guys. You Thank have a you. lot of people that come to your community first mm -hmm. and uh, wind up in your museum. And uh, if you're still doing what you did in those days, you're making the hits with the people that, uh, that are impressed by it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jack. Uh -huh. Yeah, these, these museums throughout the country uh, are, are just so valuable. And I'm, I see Ron Fagan sitting right there. They have an amazing museum in Granite Falls, as do many Many of the people here have the aircraft in the museums. And uh, the question there, uh, Mary, I think you have a gentleman that would like to ask a question. Yes, I have uh, one question. Connie, I think, knows where I'm going to go with this. But the, uh, and this is directed primarily to Rod, I think. And it's not so much as a question as an observation. Um, and, and we talked of the mission of uh, the C-121 um, and, and the Navy fluid also, of course. And I was privy to watching the film and when it was retired, et cetera. And uh, I was, I, I was kind of surprised when they said 1966, I think it was retired from the inventory. And I looked at Connie and I said, well, I, I said, uh, there's, there's another variant out there that flew a lot longer than that. In fact, in the Navy, it truly flew longer than that. Um, but uh, I, was, I was stationed in, uh, in Keflavik Naval Air Station in Iceland. And I was flying Phantoms at the time, and uh, for early warning, what do I see sitting on the ramp but a 121. Of course, it was a little bit different. It had an EC before it, and it had the hump on the back, and it had the dish on the bottom, and that was our early warning, and um, that was like 1978, I do believe. And a lot of people here don't probably realize that that is truly a Warbird version, 
and it was utilized a great deal in Vietnam also, again, for early warning. And of course, you know, it was replaced by, by AWACS, and the Navy had some, e, you know, E-2s that were used also. But uh, I think it's I important to note that, uh, yeah, that, that truly is a, a warbird variant, and, uh, and really, it, it helped me. As a, as a Phantom guy, my radar would only look so far, you know, and then these, uh, their call sign was Adola. The Adola guys would start talking to us, and they go, hey, and we were intercepting bear bombers at the time, and here are these bear bombers way out there, and they knew it. We didn't, you know. They got us close, and we said, okay, we got it now, and off we went. But, uh, but yeah, I thank you also for the, uh, the restoration, for bringing it to note. Um, but I think it is also important that uh, people realize that, hey, this thing with a great big hump on the back and a dish on the bottom really helped out a lot of us fighter pilots uh, all the way through about 1978, I want to say. Well, that's great to know. Thank you. And, and your, your airplane, uh, it, it served in Vietnam with transporting uh, people uh, who uh, were a very important part of that. Uh, so, so, Rod, uh, if we, uh, did I have another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, young man, up top. First, I just want to say thank you to everyone here and everyone that's not here for bringing the Constellation. That's always been one of those iconic, legendary aircraft that I never thought I'd get a chance to see fly. And looks like tomorrow's going to be that day. So, sorry if I sound like a kid in the candy store, because that's exactly what I am. <laughs> um, but to piggyback off the first question, as far as leaving during one of the air shows, is that still planned for Friday, or you're doing Saturday, or is that kind of fluid right now? Because I'm leaving Sunday, so I was hoping to catch it on one of those two days. I do think do the, uh, you still think, are you leaving Friday, or do you know? <coughs> Excuse me. Rod, Rod can take um, that. Probably, since we're arriving so late, we're thinking about Saturday departure. Actually, yeah. we're we're looking yeah. for donations to fill it up with fuel. Yeah, exactly. so, no, I'm kidding. No, we'll I we'll am, stay, we'll stay a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. So yeah. along those lines, how much fuel does this airplane hold? I'm talking gallons, not dollars in today's dollars. 965 gallons. I'm sorry, I stepped down. You say that? About $75,000 worth. No, it's 5,900 gallons, yeah. Yeah, 6,000 yeah. gallons. And you're month. burning how much per hour? Well, it depends on where the throttles are, but uh, mm -hmm. flying here, we were 100 gallons an hour. 100 gallons an hour. 1,330 horsepower cruise, and it was indicating so, 250 knots across the ground. Yeah, we were running 260 sometimes across the ground. Yeah. We were burning 400 to 420 an hour. Yeah, total, all four. Total, all, all four. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, it, it's good to have all four. Not yeah. absolutely necessary, yeah. but uh, it's good <laughs> to burn 400 gallons got an hour. 50 gallon oil tanks too, so it can stay up. Yeah. Actually, I've seen a video where they've shut down three engines and it'll fly on one engine. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's in YouTube. Uh, Arthur Godfrey is talking about the Super Connie, the most safest uh, airliner in the world and he, yeah. he goes, "Watch this." It's like, "Okay, here it comes." I hate it when they say, "Watch this." Yeah, I know. It's like, "Uh." <laughs> Well, I guarantee you they didn't have very much fuel on board. Yeah, I guarantee you. Uh, they, 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 they probably did it probably right over Edwards Air Force Base, too. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had places to land yeah, right, if, yeah. if they needed to. So, uh, uh, Rod, any closing comments? I oh, just want to thank the crew, the, the guys that aren't here. That was a good point. Uh, they're obviously working the hardest. We're over here kind of relaxing for the day anyway. <laughs> so, uh, But we'll get right back over there in the morning and, and join them want to thank them. Thank you for inviting us and uh, having us here. And uh, you guys have anything to add? Just like I say, we got some um, famous people in the audience. I want yeah. to thank you for all you guys do. And thanks for, for you know, sure. Yeah. And we're going to get the Connie <laughs> here tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And, and Stuart, as the pilot, is there anything I've missed that you think people would be interested in knowing about the airplane? They just need to come look at this thing. It's, yeah. it's really impressive. Yeah. It is really impressive. If you like airplanes and you don't like the Connie, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, who wouldn't like a Connie? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, you led me into that. That was not planned. <laughs> uh, guys, I, Rod, Steve, Stu, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, it's been my honor, and I thank you uh, for all of you being here late afternoon looking into the sun. But uh, thank you guys so much. This is going to be really special to uh, see you come in tomorrow. You have to let us know uh, what time you're coming, okay? We'll okay, do one more thing. I want to thank my wife for letting me do Karen. this. Karen. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Karen. Uh, She's always patting me on the back. As long as I come home happy, she's happy. Yeah, it was really her dad that's responsible Absolutely. for most right. of this, right? Yeah. Uh, so thank Aviation also, wives are really understanding. With the first time we left the Chino pattern and we went to, we were buzzed uh, 
Santa Maria Airport. I don't see Chris. He was here a minute ago. But on the way back, it just slapped on me, or I said dawned on me. I slapped myself in the face because I'm just, I got a tear in my eye thinking about Ed because, you know, I almost argued with him. We don't need this thing, you know. It's like, but mm -hmm. here we go. Thanks, Ed. He knew better than me he, for sure. He knew how. more than you did. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, to all the uh, the crew chiefs and the wives, and and I, I often think, you know, of course, you know, I fly airplanes, so I'm just a little little odd here myself. But for the women who support. Um, what our passion is, and they don't always know all the terms that you're throwing out there and the enthusiasm that you get to go fly an airplane. But th those ladies are very special. Uh, and so my hat's off to all of you, and April's up there also. So uh, thank you. And uh, gentlemen, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.